Grace and peace to you from Onalaska First United Methodist Church. You're listening to our podcast. We hope you enjoy. So in um, 1946, October 24th, 1946, scientists had this crazy idea about strapping a camera to a German V-2 rocket and shooting it up in space to see what kind of images they could capture. And after the camera took its pictures, it dropped a canister of film down to the earth and they retrieved it and they processed the film. And what they had was their first very grainy, very crude black and white picture of the curvature of the earth from outer space. Nobody had ever seen that before. But this crude black and white photo sparked the imagination of scientists and photographers. They suddenly began to realize that if we can get further out in space and if we can get better pictures, who knows the kinds of things that we could do with this, mapping, studying weather patterns. And so that kind of became a goal for some of those scientists. And as the space race got underway in the 60s, And eventually in the early 70s, the cameras got better, the spaceships got better, they got further and further out. And there are two photos that I've printed in your bulletin that are famous. Lots of photos have been taken of the Earth, but these are two of the most famous. The one on the right, if you look in the back here, that's called Earthrise. Now that was the Apollo 8 space mission to the moon. It was a lunar mission, 68. And this was the first time that anybody had taken a photo of the Earth with another body, not a planet, but a, but a body, another surface in the foreground. So the lunar surface is there with the Earth in the background. So the photographer named that Earthrise. The one on the left, this was from Apollo 17. This one's called the Blue Marble. This was actually the last lunar mission meaning that this was the last time that humans were that far away from Earth and were able to take a picture like this. Now, lots of pictures have been taken of the Earth, some really, really cool ones. But since this shot in 72, the rest of them have been taken by machines and robots. This was the last human-taken photo. And this is the most replicated photo of all time of the Earth. It even became a stamp. Ask Diana, she'll tell you. Became a stamp, the blue marble. You know, when these images started to come in, I think we started to realize what a beautiful place that we live in. It was just a different vantage point, seeing it from space. In fact, they started calling the Earth the living planet because from space you could see how everything worked together, land, water, clouds. You could see all that moving around. You could see the, from here, you can't see it, but from up there, the the thin layer of ozone, which keeps us warm, keeps the oxygen on the planet, and then also protects us from the sun's radiation, right? I mean, we could just tell from space, like, we live in a very beautiful place. But as beautiful as the earth is and as peaceful and tranquil as it is from space, for us here on the ground, well, we know firsthand the depths of evil and suffering and destruction and chaos that humans can both experience and participate in. Humans can do some pretty destructive things not only to themselves, but to others. And so God's people, really, because of that, I think God's people have always wrestled with this idea of how they ought to interact with the world. Now, I'm not talking about the planet, although this does involve the planet. What is our job concerning proper care of the planet? But I'm talking more so about God's people wrestling with how do we live in the world, the church, How does the church live in the world? And maybe you've thought about this. Maybe you've spent a great deal of time thinking about this, and you already have an idea in your head of what 
the church's relationship is to the world. Maybe you've never thought about that before. It's never even crossed your mind. But this is the question. How are we as followers of Jesus to interact with the rest of the world? 1949, just three years after that crude black and white photo, a scholar named H. Richard Niebuhr gave a series of lectures that were eventually printed in a book. That book became very famous. It's called Christ and Culture. Uh, it's, it's a deep book, but if you ever have a chance to read it, you should. In this book and in these lectures, Niebuhr identifies five classic ways in which Christians have interacted with the world or how they have seen their job in the world and how they have responded to the world. I don't want to break down the book for you. If you have time, you can read it. I don't want to go over all five of his ways and talk about what he says about it. But I, I do, they're interesting. And so I want to explore just, just a few of them today. One of the most popular ways that Christians have responded to the world, and when I say the world here, I'm talking about God's people versus people who are not God's people or do not claim God as their God, right? God's people and then outside of that. One of the popular ways is just to ignore the world, right? Just ignore the world completely. There were many, many, many monks and nuns. We call them the desert fathers and mothers when Christianity was, was still very, very new. They kind of retreated from the big metro areas and just went out into the desert to just kind of get away from all of that because for them... They wanted to pursue union with God really without any distraction. Another famous group that did that, the Amish folks, right? I mean, they just kind of formed their own communities and kept to themselves, and they uh, kind of cast aside any modern advancements, electricities, automobile, automobiles. They just kind of kept to themselves. In some respect, we have that here in Onalaska. We are two hours away from the big city. Like, we like our quiet. We like the lake. We like looking at the stars. They have problems in the city that we don't necessarily want here, right? So this has been a popular way for Christians to kind of respond to the world. And I got to tell you, in many ways, I really like this view. I mean, for me, you just give me a Bible and a good book and some peace and quiet, and I'm like a happy camper, right? It really appeals to me. There's another way uh, Christians have kind of seen their response to the world or job in the world is to convert the world, really to transform the world. You see this um, really pretty, pretty clearly in modern politics. There are some Christians here on planet Earth that believe that if you can just elect the right people into office, if you can just enact the right laws if you can make this into a Christian place, then all will be well. So that's another view that people have taken. The flip side of that, though, is to kind of grow complacent. Maybe you know Christians, maybe you, maybe you think this, I don't know, that you know, God is just like in control of all this. And so who are we as little people to really try to change anything or say anything? Have you ever heard somebody say, Hey, God, our leaders that are in, God put those leaders in positions of power. So who are you to speak out against God? That is, that's kind of a position. And so you just kind of grow complacent. Like there's really nothing for me to do in this world because God is God and I just trust in that and I'm just going to leave it alone. The problem with all of these options that I just kind of laid out for you is that they don't really reflect the life of Jesus. They don't. Jesus, number one, never ignored the world. As much as I like a Bible and a book and peace and quiet, Jesus was in the world. He, now, he took retreats. Don't get me wrong. He would take these retreats. He, went, he was in the wilderness for 40 days, right? But then he always got back into it. He was always hanging out with the wrong people, right? Spending the bulk of his time with sinners 
tax collectors, prostitutes, religious folks. Like, that's where he was. He was in that place. He was eating with them, talking with them, healing them, teaching them, showing them grace. So that's not really a viable option. Jesus also never forced people. Didn't force people to do things his way. He was more interested in preaching the gospel, and he spoke hard truths in love, but he met people where they were, and the decision to follow Jesus was always up to them. Jesus never forced anybody, because he knew, I think he knew, Forcing a a change in behavior is not the same thing as changing hearts, right? We can enact laws and force people to live a certain way, but that doesn't mean their hearts are changed. And God seems more interested in the change of heart than in change of behavior. So he never forced anybody. Jesus certainly wasn't complacent. Jesus was not complacent. You remember that little scene in the temple, right? He went in and started throwing tables around telling people what he thought about their practices out in the outer courts. He he never had a problem pointing out flaws in theological thinking or worldly reasoning. Like Jesus spoke out about injustice, and Jesus challenged the misuse of power. So complacency wasn't really an option either. There is another way, though, that Christians have responded to the world. This might be the most popular way. And that is to compartmentalize your life, right? We are citizens of the world, but we are also citizens of heaven. And so you live your life as a citizen of the world, perhaps during the week. You participate in the systems that society has set up. You vote, you pay your taxes, you serve in the military, you shop at Walmart, You bank at the local bank. You're a citizen of the world. But on Sunday, you come to this place, and you are a citizen of heaven. And you worship. And maybe you do a little mission work out and about during the week, or maybe when you're in a restaurant, in a public place, you stop and pray before you eat. But for the most part, you keep them separated. And Christianity really has... No business in the workplace or in this place, but the secular world sure better not come up in this place. Like, this is church. We don't want no secular here, and I don't want it in the privacy of my home. And so we just kind of keep those separated. We even have, what do we have in America, right? Separation of church and state. That's like how we function, right? Keep it compartmentalized. And our text today, that you heard read a little bit ago, seems like maybe Jesus is saying this very thing. Now, I'm going to read it to you again from the NIV. This is Mark chapter 12. I'm just going to read 13 through 17. This is what it says. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They're buttering him up, right? Some good things there. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed. Right? Seems like maybe this is what Jesus is saying. They want to know, should we pay taxes or no? Should we participate in the world and in the world systems or no? And Jesus knows it's a trap. He even says... This is a trap. You're trying to trick me. Because Jesus knows, right? If he says, yes, you should pay the tax, then what he is essentially doing, he's he's aligning himself with Rome. He's denying the fact that the Roman occupation in their land and the forced imperial tax upon Jews, he's denying that that's unjust. He's also recognizing another 
king besides God, right? There's Caesar and there's God. So if he says yes, like he's committing to all that stuff. But if he says no, well, then he's aligning himself against Rome, which is illegal, which is what they're hoping he's going to say so that they can run and tell Caesar, you got this guy who is telling other people not to pay the Roman tax. And he could be arrested and tried for treason. And so what Jesus says, very diplomatically, is give the world what belongs to the world and give to God what belongs to God. Compartmentalize. It's easy. Except for he's not saying that. He's not saying that. He says, he says bring me a denarius. Now, the fact that somebody in that group had a denarius, a Roman coin, shows that they're already participating in Roman life, right? They've got Roman money in their pocket. We want to talk about that. <laughs> Show me a coin. Whose image and inscription is on the coin? They say Caesar. Caesar's is. Here's what he doesn't say, but is implied by his question. This is so cool. Are you ready for this? If we know what is Caesar's, by what bears his image and inscription, how do we know what belongs to God? What bears the image and inscription of God? Well, according to Genesis 1.27, every human on the planet bears the image of God. According to Romans 1.20, all of creation bears the inscription of God of God, which means everyone and everything belongs to God, including Caesar. <laughs> I love that. And since everything and everyone belongs to God, that means we can't so easily separate sacred from secular. It's not so easy to separate holy from unholy because the lines that we want to draw start to become a little blurry when we realize that the world has sacred value because it belongs to God. All the world has sacred value because it belongs to God. And then when you start to realize that God is in the process of redeeming all which belongs to him. That puts a different spin on it. That shakes it up a little bit. So then how ought we to live in this world? How should we as followers of Jesus live in this world which belongs to God and has sacred value and the potential to glorify God? Well, I want to go back to Jesus. How did Jesus live in the world? I'm going to give you three don'ts and two do's. Okay? Number one, I've already said it, don't be quick to draw sharp lines between what is sacred and secular. We all do it. We all judge in our mind that this is good and that's bad, but don't be so quick to draw sharp lines. You may recall a story in which Jesus said he found the greatest faith of anyone that he had encountered. Do you remember who it was? It was a Roman soldier. Not even a Jew, a Roman soldier. And he said, this man has the greatest faith of any that I have encountered anywhere. Don't be sharp. Don't be quick to draw those sharp lines between sacred and secular. Number two, don't withdraw from what you have judged to be the world. We're going to do it. We automatically draw those lines, but do not withdraw from those places that you think are secular. Stay in them. Jesus stayed in them. And I'm going to prove it to you in just a bit. Number three, don't try to force it to conform to your idea of what Christian is. Because your idea of what Christian is supposed to look like may not be right, number one. And number two, forcing change is not the same as changing hearts. 
And God is always interested in changing hearts. Do, do look for beauty in the world. Poetry, music, the arts, cultures, peoples. God made it all. So you should expect to find God there somewhere. Even in the darkest places, even in those places that do not honor God, I believe firmly that there is no place on the planet that is completely devoid of the grace of God. Right? Mr. Rogers famously said, asked his mom one time, why are there so many bad things in the world? And she said, you know, look for the helpers. Look for the ones who are doing God's work in those dark places. Look for beauty in the world. Because God, God can be found everywhere. And lastly, oh, yeah, I, I wrote this in my notes. I should probably say it. Just because we all belong to God doesn't mean that everybody knows whose they are. Which leads me to my last point. Do live in the world as one who knows whose they are. Okay? You do this by preaching the good news, loving your neighbor, befriending the lost like Jesus, voicing opposition to those things which do not honor God. We are to call those out as God's people, but also rejoice in those things which do. In a nutshell... Make your life into a living testimony. The Bible calls it a living sacrifice. Make your life a proclamation that says, God is our creator. God is our redeemer. God is our sustainer. And God wants you to know that world So here's what I want to close with. This is from John chapter 17, famous prayer that Jesus prayed right before he was crucified. His final moments, his deepest concern was for his disciples. And he also explicitly mentions all those who would come to believe because of the disciples' message. So you and me, right? So Jesus is praying for us in this moment, right before he dies. Here's what he says. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Jesus is not asking that we be taken out of the world. Did you get that? But I ask you to protect them from the evil one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's the mission. We are to remain in the world so that the world might come to know how much God loves them. But to do that, you have to interact with the world. You have to be honest and real with the world. You have to not try to force them to change. Just walk like Jesus. And you leave the rest up to God. That is my prayer for us. Especially in these times, as Mary Helen pointed out this morning, we are called to be a light in this moment of chaos and disorder and panic. Let's not retreat. Let's not be scared. Let's live into that so that the world might know that Jesus is the Savior and that God loves them so much. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.